My name is Michael Waits. And I'm Tanya Wolf. Hey, Tanya. Welcome back to the Moneymakers podcast brought to you by Sophia. The Moneymakers podcast is a finance and investing show for amazing women of all ages. Every fortnight, we feature an inspiring woman. And this week, we are fortunate to have two amazing ladies on the show. From the finance sector, we will cover different topics within finance, innovation, and investing with a special focus on Asia. And this team should be able to cover all that stuff super well. Our guests today are Kathy Matsui and Yumiko Murakami, the GPs of Empower Partners. Kathy and Yumiko, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. It is our pleasure. Yumiko, let's start with you. Can you give our listeners just a quick introduction and a little bit of your background? Sure. So I was running the Tokyo office of the OECD, which is an international organization. They're based in Paris, but I was running their Tokyo office for almost eight years until we launched this fund at the end of May. But I actually spent almost 20 years before I joined OECD. So it's sort of like going back to the financial industry after spending eight years in the public sector. And this time with two of my long-term friends, Kathy Matsui and Miyaseki, to invest in the startups, which is a new space for me. But in terms of the financial industry experience, I spent quite a bit of time before I joined OECD. Also, just to give a little bit of background, I am from Japan. I'm Japanese. I was born in Japan. I did all my schooling up to college in Japan. And then I went to the U.S. for my graduate studies, and I ended up staying there. I did not come back to Japan for a long time, almost 20 years. Most of the time I spent in the U.S. with Goldman Sachs in the New York office. And in fact, Kathy and I joined Goldman Sachs in the same year, 1994, although she was in Tokyo, I was in New York, um, but we, we knew each other uh, for a long time. So coming back to Japan after a long time in the U.S. was a very interesting eye-opening experience. I should know the culture because I'm from here, but it was a little bit of culture shock uh, <laughs> to come back to this country. I can talk a little bit about that later on. But anyway, so that's my background. And I'm very, very excited to be in the VC space now. And this is just the beginning. It's been only three and a half months since we launched the fund. But you know, every day I'm learning a lot of new things. So that's very exciting. Kathy. Sure. So I have almost the mirror opposite background to Yumiko. I am a second generation Japanese American born and raised in the United States. I grew up on a farm in California. I went to college and then I came to Japan for the first time after university, which was like Yumiko said, a culture shock for me. I look like any other Japanese person. My blood is 100% Japanese, but I grew up in America. So I had a very outsider's view looking in to the society. But I started working at Barclays as a Japanese equity strategist for my first four years. And working as a Japanese equity strategist would have been great during the asset bubble of the late 80s, but I wasn't lucky enough to start that early. I started right after the peak of the bubble. So most of my career, frankly, has been observing a market that has gone more down than up. (laughs) I was in research my entire career, looking at the overall stock market, looking at the challenges of the market, challenges facing Japanese companies. And I wrote about the lack of diversity. I wrote about the four standards of corporate governance in Japanese corporate society. And part of that will give you some hints as to why we started an ESG-focused VC fund. But that's my career. So a very challenging market environment and mainly focused on public equities as opposed to private. But I think all three of us, we share this common mission dream that we want Japan to have a more prosperous future for our children, for our grandchildren. We know there are lots of headwinds facing the nation. And we want to, in a small way, try to make that future brighter. I want to talk about the culture because I don't think you can separate investing in Japan without talking about the culture. And just to give you a little bit of background, if you don't know this, I landed in Japan on February 20th, 1990, working for Morgan Stanley and stayed until the end of 2011. 
mostly at Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. So my career arc was very similar. Our timing was very similar to yours, Kathy. When I arrived, if I remember correctly, it's a long time ago now, the Nikkei was at 38,000. Mm -hmm. And I just remember watching it go down and down and down the whole time. So it was a very challenging environment. And there were always little spikes, you know, when it goes down to 7,600 and then spikes up a little bit, everybody gets happy and everybody says that the market has fundamentally changed. But in reality, it hadn't. Anyway, I, in a way, am like, Yumiko, when I go back to the United States, I'm confused because I feel like I should know what's going on. And in a way like you, Kathy, I look American, but my entire adult career was in Japan. So there's a part of me that feels Japanese on the inside that nobody else can see. Anyway, I just wanted to give you a little bit of that context. So when we have this conversation, you'll understand where I'm coming from as well. Before we dig a little bit deeper, and either one of you can answer this, Let's talk exactly about what Empower Partners is, just to start. Okay, so let me start, and Kathy, please chime in. So we are the first ESG-focused venture capital fund in Japan. We are also, we didn't intend to be, but we just happened to be the first female-led VC in Japan as well. We are not so-called social impact fund, meaning that we aim to competitive financial returns for our investments. And we believe we can do so by integrating ESG into our investment process. We are aiming roughly two-thirds of investments to be made in Japan or Japanese startups, and the rest, so one-third anywhere outside Japan. Looking at the deal flows, we are seeing a lot of companies in the U.S., interesting companies from Asian countries as well. So we're a global fund. We look at mainly mid to late stage companies in Japan. We look at little earlier stage companies outside Japan, but our focus is really to look for companies that can become global, that are scalable and really become unicorns. And we are looking for companies that are taking advantage of technologies and looking at very challenging situations that societies are facing and we really try to figure out how to solve them by utilizing technologies. And we do believe those companies are the ones who can also identify very, very interesting business opportunities. So that's the approach that we're taking. And like I said, we are the first one in Japan. I think there are several ESG-focused funds in, in Europe and maybe a few in the U.S. And our hope is there are going to be more funds like ourselves in Japan, but also on a global basis as well. Yeah, I was just going to ask, are there any sectors of innovation that are particularly exciting you in this region? In Asia or in general? In, in Asia. Kathy, you want to take on that one? We find lots of interesting opportunities in areas such as healthcare and wellness, a lot of opportunities in the, what we call digital transformation, need to improve productivity space, particularly here in Japan. We are finding a number of interesting opportunities in sustainability, which of course, anything sustainability environment related is very hot right now. So there are lots of areas. We are pretty generalistic. We don't have one or two sector focuses. We're yeah. pretty broad. Yeah largely because of the stage we're focused on, which, as Yumiko said, is later stage as opposed yeah. to early. Maybe you just want to explain to people what ESG is and why as well that you have to explain to people that you can still have competitive financial returns while investing in ESG. That's a great question. So you probably know the acronym stands for Environment, Social, and Governance. Mm -hmm. And perhaps one of the genesis of this acronym is from the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. As you know, these are very broad, big, ambitious goals that the United Nations put forth to be reached globally by the year 2030. Right. And I think ESG was a way of transposing those goals into the capital markets slash investment context. If you're an asset allocator or if you're an asset owner, how do you, in your daily activities of capital allocation, how are you able to fulfill uh, these goals? And so this framework came about, I think, related to that. And I think it's fair to say that when it first emerged in the investment world, people linked ESG to, like Yumiko was saying, impact investing right. or not charity, but 
Almost like NGOs, yeah. Exactly. And therefore, there was this concept of, oh, you're doing ESG, then you're giving up performance, i.e. there was this perception that ESG was equated with a performance trade-off. But as there is plenty of evidence now to prove over the last, not just one, three years, but five to 10 years, in fact, if you look at, it's mainly evidence only in the public equity arena, but those investment products that are linked to ESG or sustainability have actually outperformed their peers or or the rest of the market. So there is no more performance trade-off. And why is that? I think it's simply because if you are trying to assess risk, let's say, of an enterprise, of a company, and you're only looking at financial metrics, you may be missing a lot of things. You know, take COVID, right? How have you treated your employees? Did you bring the axe out (laughs) at the first month of a big drop in sales, or did you keep them on the payroll? How do you think about how your company is governed? Do you have enough independence on the board? There's a lot of micro factors in the ESG framework, but many of these were not material factors in the decision of whether a company is over or undervalued in the past, or they weren't incorporated in a risk assessment. But if you're really going to take a holistic risk picture, you have to incorporate both the financial metrics, but also the non-financial metrics as well. And that's what I think is really important about ESG these days. Yeah, I mean, there's a suggestion in what you're saying that says, and I love the way you put this, if you're going to analyze all the risks associated with a company and you're not analyzing the ESG risks, you may actually lose money in places because of blind spots not associated with analyzing all of the associated risks for any company. And I think that there's, at least what I see in the recordings that I do across all verticals is that there's this real secular change taking place. And I'm curious about what you think about Japan as well. But there's a real secular change taking place globally where almost every company that gets started now has to have some sort of ESG in it, right? Because investors want to have those opportunities and they also want to be able to manage those risks. Does that make sense? And to be clear, this is not just to mitigate risks. It's also to come up with more innovative products or a new sales strategy or tap new markets through innovation, through diversity of thought, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. And I think obviously the more diverse the founding members are of any company, the more diverse the opinions are going to be. And the more diverse the opinions are going to be, the more diverse the product development you're going to have. It's a win for everybody, I think. Can you both characterize the current state of Japan's venture ecosystem? And then talk about how it can be made actually more global, more diverse, and more innovative. I think that there is a lot of really exciting stuff happening in Japan. And I do think that the fact that we have been receiving a lot of support in terms of what we're doing is also an indication in terms of maybe things are happening, things are changing in Japan, especially around ESG, around diversity. So I'm very optimistic. But if you look at Japan relative to other countries, for example, you know Europe or US or even compared to Asia, there is a lot for Japan to do in the ecosystem, as you mentioned, of, say, VCs or in general startups. So one of them is the fact that there is a lot of money in Japan, but very little risk money. Right. <laughs> money is, is everywhere in Japan. Japanese companies are sitting on this huge pile of cash. But then again, there is this a really strong risk averse culture still in Japan. And I do think that needs to change. And I do think there is a sense that Japan really needs to change the risk appetite. So the one is money, whether there is going to be more risk money. And we actually have been seeing in the context of Japan, there have been more new venture capital funds. A lot of them are focusing on late stage investments. These are the funds that are coming to market, which I think is is really good. But again, compared to the rest of the world, Japan is so behind in terms of how much risk money there is in the system. And therefore, there's a lot more to go. Uh, So talking about the ecosystem of of Japanese startups, money, number one, definitely we need more risk money. Number two, I think in terms of companies, in terms of startups themselves, the fear of failure is still strong. So that needs to change. And I think it has to some extent to do with the fact that Japanese society still operates on this lifetime employment system in terms of how companies 
hire their employees at the age of 22 when they graduate from universities and they stay, these employees stay with the same companies for 35 years. So I think that makes it harder for people to take risks, professional risks. But I do think also that is starting to change. If you look at some of the Japanese traditional companies who are starting to shift away from the lifetime employment system, I think that is really going to change the mobility within the Japanese labor market. Right. So I think that is also going to help in terms of how startups are going to be able to attract more talents. Maybe young people are more interested in entrepreneurships than startups, and that is starting to take place in Japan. But again, compared to other countries, it is starting to show the sign. It's still early. So I do think there are a number of really interesting and exciting trends that are starting to emerge. But again, relative to the US, relative to Asia, relative to Europe, Japan has so much potential. I think Japan has a lot to go. And I feel very lucky that together with Kathy and Miwa, who is a third GP who's not here with us today, we have been able to time the launch of our fund <laughs> this year. Like this is the best time for us to do this because I do think all the stars are aligned. So again, talking about the ecosystem, there is a lot to be done, but I do think there are a number of very positive signs that I see from my vintage point that makes me feel like, oh, I got the timing right. <laughs> As three female founding partners of a VC, which is very rare anywhere in the world, let alone in Japan, where you're obviously the pioneers. Harvard Business Review says that women in managing partner roles and decision-making roles within VCs tend to statistically invest into more diverse founders, specifically women founders, two and a half times more than a traditional male-led VC fund, which is the majority of the VC ecosystem at the moment. Do you have, as part of the ESG focus, as well as being three female founders, do you have a gender lens when it comes to investing? We don't have a official or formal quota or target for what percent of our portfolio will be diverse founder-led. However, we happen to be right now all females, although we're hiring our first male. It's coming in a couple of weeks, so <laughs> we will be diverse too. But we ultimately want to give equal opportunities to every founder that we speak with. We don't really care at all what their ethnicity, their gender, any of that. But if given two equal opportunities, they look equally promising, and one happens to be led by a diverse founder, we probably will lean towards that company as opposed to the non-diverse founder. So I think just given the fact that pretty much all of us have worked in maybe survived in Japan's very male-dominated financial industry. As minorities, we know what it's like. I've met female entrepreneurs here who she went to pitch to some VC firm, and she's the founder. And after her presentation, she was asked by the gentleman across the table, so I assume your CFO is a male. Wow. And that's in the year 2019, 2020. Mm. And again, Japan is not alone. No. No, 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 no. It's pretty much everywhere. And, yeah. and so I think the fact that if we can show the world that women, diverse people can be capital allocators, we can be risk takers with money, we can be venture capitalists. This is nothing unusual. Right. <laughs> Anybody yeah. can pretty much do it <laughs> if you put your mind to it. That's fantastic. Yeah. We also hope the same would be with ESG investing in venture capital. It's pretty new. We think we are pioneers in Japan. We're the first, but we certainly hope we're not the last. We hope that many, many more funds will follow us because we need to create a larger movement. And that, of course, does encompass diversity, values, well-being, you know, a lot of these principles and values that I think need to be embedded more deeply into companies. When you look at the ecosystem, the VC ecosystem in Japan, is it dominated more by CVC, so corporate venture capital, and maybe specifically bank venture capital? And I guess the follow-on to that would be, you mentioned earlier that there has to be a mindset change. And did you get the sense that when you were pitching to people to raise capital, that they kind of knew what ESG fund was, but that you had to explain to them? And then once you did, they're like, oh, we have to do this. Or has that mindset change already started to take place in the places where all the money is? That's already occurred. Japan has been 
probably as a market, one of the fastest growing ESG markets in the world in the last few years. It arrived late or later than Europe and the United States. But really since, I guess, 2015, when the Government Pension Investment Fund, right. GPI of the world's largest public pension fund, initiated ESG investing for them, then everybody in town who was an asset manager who wanted the GPI of mandate, guess what? They had to have ESG in their toolkit. So we didn't have to convince people how important ESG was, but there were questions about, wait a minute, even large publicly traded companies haven't fully embraced ESG. <laughs> how are you going to get startups to embrace ESG? Which is a valid question. But I think at least from my vantage point, as I said, I've been researching publicly traded companies for my entire career right. and writing about how governance practices should change. Yeah. They're far from the global standard, et cetera. And it's just very hard to change large established companies. It's just not in their DNA. So part of our thesis here is let's work with companies when they're not quite adults, they're in their formative years. And that will be easier, hopefully, to embed these ESG principles. And frankly, we have all been surprised positively by the fact that a lot of founders that we speak with are quite aware of ESG, mm. surprisingly so. They know they have to do this X, Y, Z, but they don't know how to get from A to B right. in environment or in social or in governance. And that's where we come in. We have that experience and knowledge, and we can help them apply those principles and integrate them into their businesses. To answer your first question, CVCs versus independent VCs, I think mm -hmm. it is true that um, Japan's VC industry was dominated by CVCs until quite recently. But if you look at um, the new funds that have been launched in the last, say, year or two, most of them are actually independent VCs. So I think now there's a more healthier mixture or split. And then the other thing that I was going to say is to Tanya's question in terms of gender lens, do we have gender lens approach in terms of our investment selection? I think one of the things our LPs see in us is we have natural gender lens. <laughs> we happen to be a minority or all of the three of us. We've been always a minority in, in all our different roles. You know, we worked at different companies, different organizations. And I think that can give us a very unique perspective on things versus 99% of other venture capitalists in Japan. So if you look at the incoming inquiries, incoming companies, if they're not female, business tend to focus on female businesses, for example, because they think that they understand their business better which I think is interesting. So, so a lot of them actually run by men, by the way, but they have these markets, they, they have business models that are just targeting womanomics. Some of them are actually run by female uh, entrepreneurs, but we don't have that many female founders in Japan as yet. So we need to start working on the mindset that we need to work on in terms of how female students, high school, universities, they need to be encouraged to look into entrepreneurship. And that's where we need to start. What's interesting is companies who would like to talk to us, many of them come to us thinking, oh, if we talk to Empower, we can actually ask Kathy san to join our board. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they naturally think we can help them to diversify their boards or their management teams. And quite frankly, this is one of the most unique competitive advantage that we have relative to other venture capitalists because we do have very strong networks. Not that I think, you know, we cannot have more than one Kathy, so she cannot do that for every company who come to us. <laughs> but we do have very strong networks in terms of making introductions, connections. And I think that's great. The companies are looking to do that. Their companies realize that they need to really address the issue of diversity. So I think that's very encouraging that companies are really interested in making a push on gender. I can just sorry add one more comment on the ecosystem because I think this might help understand the context of why we're doing what we're doing is that part of the reason why Japan's venture industry is so small, some people say it's 150th United States, for instance, even though it's grown sevenfold in the last seven years, it's still pretty tiny. There are some unicorns, but they're fewer and farther between than 
in other jurisdictions right. is the fact that many of the startups here, their exit is one thing, and that is doing an IPO on the mother's exchange. Right. And what that means is it is relatively easy to go public on mothers or in Japan in general right. versus other global markets. Yeah, yeah. And so when you reach a stage of growth in your company and you need quite a bit of capital to get to that next level, if you don't have access to large investors, growth investors, later stage investors, then that's really your only option. Right. And I think over 90% of the exits here are IPOs, whereas in the States, it's almost the opposite. 90%, I believe, are M&A. And so we kind of look at this overall landscape and think, well, why does IPO have to be the only option? Right. And you see a lot of companies, frankly, go public prematurely yeah. because they're so desperate for capital. They see that bell. They want to ring that bell. But then after they rung that bell, oftentimes they just don't grow as was expected. And so we think that with our global network, our experience, we can bring other options to these entrepreneurs, perhaps to be acquired by a non-Japanese company if they're Japanese. We're also investing in foreign companies. We're trying to help foreign companies who want to enter Japan. There might be Japanese companies who want to acquire these foreign startups. So part of this, you know, why is it so small question has to do with this exit issue. Yeah. And that is one reason why we're focused on the later stage in Japan, right. because there's a dearth of capital being provided at that stage. As Yumiko said, there are more VC funds like us cropping up. I think there's 130, 140 VC funds in the entire country, but the vast majority are early stage focused. You think it's fair to say that a mother's listing for a startup company was more like a series A or a pre-series B raise for growth capital? than it would have been in the United States. And one of the reasons why, obviously, for people that don't know what Mothers is, it's meant to have sort of less stringent listing requirements. Mm -hmm. And again, that made it easier, like you said, to go public, but not in the same way as going public on NASDAQ or going public on the New York Stock Exchange, because the requirements are just completely different. Is that fair? I think that's accurate. Both of you also mentioned that some of the earlier stage investments that you want to make are in foreign companies that may want to expand in Japan. And, you know, I know this from living in Japan for 22 years and being in Asia for 30, but Japan can appear very enigmatic to outsiders. It just can't. It looks scary really? to them from the outside. You know me. For a <laughs> but I give U.S. founders flack for this all the time. You know, when they expand or go global, they go to Australia or they go to the U.K. or maybe they go to Europe because they can sort of feel like it's easier. But most of them miss Japan. Most of them miss Korea because it just looks so hard for them. How can we change that perception in reality? Good By question. <laughs> successful examples of companies that can do it, that can break in. Yeah. Of course, if you're talking about regulated sectors, be it healthcare or financial services, you have to navigate that regulatory spiderweb. And if you don't have the political connections or regulatory relationships, it's a tough place to navigate, mm. no doubt. But also another interesting thing about Japan is, for example, you know, regulation point of view, it is a difficult market to crack. But in terms of commercial opportunities, Japan, for example, is a forefront of aging society. Yep. And there is a huge market potential if someone has interesting idea to tap into this emerging silver economy market. Japan is the place to be. And it is an interesting time now that, you know, this this demographic tsunami, which, you know, for us in Japan, it's the reality. It's, it's already here. For the rest of the world, it may be coming tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, 10 years down the road, but it is happening at different times in the next decade or two. So I do think Japan can be a really interesting market if companies have business models that take advantage of digital technologies to address some of the most pressing issues that are associated with age in society. And I do think that companies who like to talk to us, they would expect us to help them in terms of making the right connections that they need with potential partners in Japan or clients in Japan. And I do think given our contacts and our networks and experience in, in the Japanese business community, we can help them. So Kathy's American, I'm Japanese, Mia is also Japanese, but both of us spent 
number of years in the U.S. and Europe. And if you look at the Japanese VC landscape, almost all of the existing VCs are very domestic. If you look at the people there sure. in terms of their backgrounds and in terms of their experience. So their approach tends to be very, very domestic. There are a few foreign owned VCs, but not that many. So I feel that this is one, of, again, one of the value adds. It is one of the things we can do for startups, companies that are interested in international expansion, especially in the Japanese market or Asian markets. In particular, silver economy is one example, but there are many other interesting emerging market segments that companies should be interested in. Yeah. I mean, when I look at home healthcare, I can't help but think about SMS. Yeah. Healthcare is another one. Right. A company founded by Shuhei Morifuji back in 2003, listed on the TSE in 2014, a great example of this. But in the ensuing seven years, it's just become more and more prevalent, not just in Japan, but in the rest of Asia. I mean, if you look at companies like Portia and Holodoc and Nightingale's Homage in, in Singapore just had a massive funding round, 40 to 45 million bucks. I think that was their series C. I mean, if you accumulate all this, it's 100, 200, 300 million dollars of fundings in that sector. So clearly a big opportunity. And you're right, with the aging in Japan, it's the perfect place actually to test that product and then roll it out to the rest of the world, right? If you look at the mean age in Japan, it's 48 point something, which is either the second highest or third highest in the world. It's perfect for this. And just maybe another concrete example in a different space. We just invested in a US-based company called Jupiter Intelligence. It is a climate risk analytics provider. Right. And if you think about the global context of A, the increased frequency of extreme climate events, and B, tightening regulatory scrutiny, demanding more accurate risk assessments of climate risks in mortgage portfolios and insurance policies. Right. Japan is a land of natural disasters. <laughs> and so if you're any kind of, you know, not just financial institution, but property or asset owner, manufacturing company with plants across the planet, you probably need to care about not just what's going to happen next year or next month, but in 20, 30, 50 years down the road, do you really have an accurate picture of the risks that you're taking? And so this company... We partner together because they think Empower will help them expand. They're already in Japan, but expand their business further into this market. It's a great example. And there are a bunch of companies that are using real-time data in the way, actually, that we used to when we traded, right? And But using it for weather-related things or other natural catastrophe type insurance products, and even moving into parametric insurance for things like internet outages. It's just the whole insurance sector is massively changing. We see that everywhere. Anyway, look, this has been an incredible conversation. I don't want to take up any more of your time unless there's something that we missed that you'd want to reference. But I thought today was awesome. Kathy Matsu, Yumiko Murakami, GPs of Empower Partners. Thank you so much for doing this today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.